lovely people. Today's video has been highly requested thanks to a photo that was recently doing the rounds on Twitter. That's right, we're going to be talking about the public universal friend, a Quaker who is said to have died as a young person and been reborn without gender but imbued with the spirit of God and went on to fight for gender equality and lead their own congregation in upstate New York. Now, some people consider the public universal friend, who I'm going to be referring to as the friend from here on out because that's what some of their thoughts followers did as the public universal friend is surprisingly hard to say. Some people consider the public universal friend to have been asexual, a gender nonconformist or a queer saint, whilst other consider that reporting having seen angels means that they may have been suffering from a mental illness. And I'm going to be breaking down the story for you in this video, but I'm also going to preface it with whatever you may think about this person and how they refer to themselves or the religion they followed, this channel is not the place for you to invalidate someone else's identity. If this isn't the video for you, just move on to the next one. Remember that another person's identity does not invalidate your own and that you do not have the right to invalidate theirs. It is perfectly fine to have a discussion about history or religion in the comments, but I draw the line at name calling and the insinuation that mental illness and sexual gender identity and religion are explicitly linked. Please remain respectful. Always examine your motives before posting a mean comment. Do you really want to do that? Really? This person may or may not have been non-binary or transgender, we can't say for sure because no one asked them outright, and they're not here to tell us whether they identify with what we now consider to be the meaning of those terms. Okay, now that the longest disclaimer ever is out of the way, hello again. If you're new here, hi, I'm Jessica. Please consider subscribing to this channel where I sometimes make content that touches on both religious and LGBTQ plus things and crosses over again here in this video. If you enjoy profiles of amazing disabled or LGBTQ plus figures from history, then I suggest you check out my historical profiles playlist, which you can find in a card above. And below the video, you should be able to see the merch shelf featuring this lovely Christmas jumper, which I'm now calling a winter jumper uh, because I'm going to sell it in January and February because I realised that those months are also cold. So you can get your hands on one just like mine and then we can twin. I've always wanted someone to twin with. On the 29th of November 1752, the Wilkinson family welcomed their eighth child, Jemima, to their home in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Parents Jemima and Amy Wilkinson were the third generation to live in America and attended traditional worship with the Society of Friends, commonly known as Quakers. If you would like to know more about Quakerism, I have linked my playlist with explainers in a card above and in the description below. Upon reaching late teenagedom, Jemima decided to break away and instead attend meetings with new like Baptists in Cumberland, who emphasised individual enlightenment and less of the group. Jemima was disciplined by her family and in her early 20s disowned by the Smithfield meeting as these new ideas were deemed unquakerly. Jemima was, however, unsatisfied with the New Light Baptists and faced much upheaval, having broken from family amid the American Revolutionary War. During the same year, Jemima contracted a disease that is now believed to have been typhus and was left bedridden, near death with a high fever. Once the fever had broken, Jemima then reported having died and received revelations from God through two archangels. They insisted that they were Jemima no longer, for she had died and the angels had taken her soul to heaven, leaving in her place a new, genderless spirit, charged by God with preaching his word. They insisted that their new name was the Public Universal Friend, and described that name as having come directly from God's mouth. The name referenced Public Friend, the designation the Society of Friends used for members who travelled to different communities to preach. As you can imagine, it being the 18th century, no one could attest whether they had actually died for a split second or even for longer. Detractors have since asserted that the entire illness was made up, but accounts by the attending doctor and other witnesses say that although the illness was most certainly real, no one noticed the death. Although, it was the 18th century though, so was anyone paying that much attention? From this point on, the friend refused to answer to Jemima Wilkinson, even to close friends and family, ignoring or chastising those who used the name. When people asked if that was the name of the person standing in front of them, the friend merely quoted Luke 23.3, Thou sayest it, i.e. if you say so. 
any attempts to use gendered pronouns were also rebuffed, with a friend insisting on gender-neutral language and presenting as something entirely new to early American society, a genderless spirit from God who eschewed gendered pronouns and dressed and spoke in ways that purposefully blurred the lines between male and female. Not that it was a particularly revolutionary concept for Native Americans, but imagine it was for the small Baptist town of Cumberland. Rising from illness, the friend began preaching a message of repentance. Granted, the content of their sermons was not strictly innovative, but the friend did something unique by embodying genderlessness as an aspect of resurrected life. On October the 13th, 1776, the Sunday after being reborn, the friend gave a public sermon for the first time. Despite being rejected as a by Quaker officials as a heretic, the friend continued and preached on throughout Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. The public universal friend's theology was broadly similar to Orthodox Quakers. I talk about Orthodox versus conservative Quakers in my Quakers and Weddings video, which I will leave in a card above again. They believed in free will, pacifism, and plain dress, opposed slavery and bedtime activities that aren't sleeping or brushing your teeth. They blended traditional Christian warnings about sin and redemption with a modern take on gender equality. Women had at this point no legal rights in the United States and many were drawn to this very progressive message, building the Society of Universal Friends in which unmarried women took leading roles in their households and community. As you can imagine, the friend had a very charming and forceful personality to match this progressive message. Okay, so it's a bit culty, but aren't all religions culty, really? The friend rejected standard women's attire and hairdos for a gender-bending appearance, commonly wearing a loose black male clergy gown with female petticoats peeking out at the hem. The friend's long hair hung to the shoulder. The rest of the friend's outfit often included apparently a man's broad-rimmed hat and women's colourful scarves. Because when you're the leader of a cult, you could wear whatever you like. Granted, the first recruits to the Society of Universal Friends were family members, but the friend soon attracted a diverse group of followers, including intellectual and economic elites, as well as the poor and depressed. Many writers have portrayed the friend as either a fraud, rather than a pioneer, upset that followers proclaimed the friend was the Messiah returned or Christ in female form, but the friend didn't actually make such claims themselves. They did, however, come to sense that the millennium was imminent and would occur about the 1st of April, 1780. Millennialism is a belief held by some religious denominations that a golden age of paradise will occur on earth prior to the final judgment. Why, which is nice, sure. Christianity and Judaism have both created some messianic movements which feature millennialist teachings, and they've often led to social unrest, like the Reformation, in which definitely no one died. However, on the 18th of May, 1780, the sun was entirely blotted out from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., which many took to be a confirmation of the friend's teachings and a sign of the imminent coming of Christ. The friend received additional followers as a result of this event. Members pooled their money and started a utopian communal settlement in the wilderness near Seneca Lake in upstate New York in 1788. As the first settlers in the region, they cleared the land and became the first white people to meet and trade with the Native Americans there. First settlers, but it's not like there wasn't already someone living there. I imagine quite fairly. Society was completely dependent upon gifts from supporters and unlike similar, cults, the friend held no property themselves, but all was held in the name of the society by a board of trustees. So that's nice. By 1790, the community had grown to a population of 260, most of whom were celibate. And you wonder why they're not around today. Followers respected the wishes of the friend and avoided gender-specific pronouns, even when writing in private diaries, referring only to the public universal friend, or short forms, the friend, or P-U-F, which I'm really hoping they said as puff, because that would lead to some excellent magic dragon jokes. The friend had various idiosyncrasies which were remarked upon. It was remarked to be excessively clean, bathing daily and insisting upon fresh, clean clothes was strange for the time, but definitely not in general. They only ate by themselves in their own room and with the door closed. Okay, a little strange. 
Hostile observers put the friend on trial for blasphemy in 1800, but the court ruled that American courts could not try blasphemy cases due to the separation of church and state in the US Constitution. In fact, the friend befriended the judge during the trial and was invited to speak a sermon on the topic of their choosing, which is pretty darn impressive. Through this, the friend was actually a pioneer in establishing freedom of speech and freedom of religion in American law. It is also very impressive because traditional Quakers have a bad history of annoying judges and ending up with longer sentences, mainly because they call everyone friend and refuse to swear on the Bible in court, since that would imply that they might lie normally. Like other isolated utopian communities based on celibacy, the Society of Universal Friends dwindled. The friend left time, as the Universal Friends put it, on July the 1st, 1819, at the age of 61. The organisation disintegrated within a few years of the founder's death. Historians are torn on the friend, calling them either a scheming fraud or manipulator, or a pioneering leader who founded several towns in which women were empowered to take roles reserved for men. Historian Michael Bronsky says in the award-winning A Queer History of the United States that the friend would not have been called transgender or transvestite by the standards of the vocabulary of the time, but he calls the friend a transgender evangelist. Susan Justice says that followers considered the friend's clothing con congregant with the, the genderless spirit which they believed animated the preacher. They both note that to followers the friend may have embodied Paul's sentiment in Galatians 3.28 that there is neither male nor female in Christ. Scott Larson writes that the friend can be understood as a chapter in trans history before transgender. So there we go, the public universal friend. Had you heard of this person before this video or before you saw them trending on Twitter last week? I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget we have a live stream on Saturday and I shall see you tomorrow for a new video. Mwah. Oh, sorry, it's just bread break. <laughs> Oh, Should I don't, take another one? Don't mind me, it's fine. It's over. <laughs> the moment the moment passed. I'm not I doing photos three anymore. Orders. It's fine. <laughs> Bye.